Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be to be here. Um, I guess it's nice to see people interested in, in in inequality, which is my field of research, and it's nice to see that it's not just a few academics that are interested in inequality. So I would usually, I would typically start this this kind of of presentation with um, a slide or, or two about yeah why why should we care about inequality? But I think it has already been done to some extent uh, by Alison. And uh, also, I guess, if you are here, it's because you, you, you care about inequality. So what I'd like to do today is, is um, explain, try to explain what do we mean by, income ine by um, sorry, economic inequality, um, how do we measure it, and then I want to show you some figures for uh, Australia and, and, and other countries. Uh, but mostly focusing on Australia. And then I want to finish by discussing the, the drivers of inequality. So what explains um, inequality and what explains uh, changes in inequality. All right, so if you look at uh, Wikipedia, you find this definition. So economic inequality is the difference found in various measures of economic well-being among individuals in a group, among groups, in a population or among countries. Then the question is how do we measure uh, economic inequality? So we have first to agree uh, on what is economic well-being. Uh, we then have to find a way to uh, summarize differences among individuals. Right? It would be too cumbersome to look at all individuals and all differences uh, among all individuals. Um, and then we have to find uh, good data or agree on what is, what is good data for that. All right, so different choices or different answers to these questions can lead to different results. And, and partly that explains why we find um, a lack of consensus sometimes uh, or a debate about whether, you know, what is the level of inequality or is it increasing, is it decreasing. Uh, part of the explanation is because there are different ways to answer these questions. And in a sense, there is not a unique right way to do it, right? Because some of these are normative issues, that as we will see. And uh, I'll try to, to explain that measuring inequality necessarily implies uh, some value judgments. Um, having said that, there are some international standards in the way we measure inequality. And so we try to uh, impose some sort of consistency so that you know, estimates are comparable across country and also uh, over time to, to, to the extent that it is possible, given that we have also data constraints. That, uh, that means that we cannot always do what we want to do uh, to measure uh, inequality. So what I want to say here is that it's important to be clear about what we mean when we talk about inequality. Uh, to if we want to have, uh, you know, a constructive debate. So um, I'm going to go through these three questions uh, one by one. So what is economic uh, well-being? How do we summarize uh, differences across, uh, between across individuals? And uh, what kind of data can we use to measure inequality uh, in Australia? So uh, economic well-being, what it is? Well, uh, the most common measure of economic well-being that is used is uh, income. So income uh, measures the flow of uh, resources over a given time period. So usually uh, the year, but sometimes the week. Right? So it's a flow. Uh, the most common definition that is used is household uh, disposable income. So that means um, after uh, income tax and government transfers. So it's pretty broad uh, definition of income that is going to include wages and salaries, uh, business income, so self-employment income, uh, investment income and government transfers, and then we deduct uh, taxes. We uh, end up with uh, disposable income. We do it at the household level because we assume that uh, that's the relevant level of analysis for um, because people are assumed to be sharing resources within a household. Um, it's also equivalized. And that means that we try to account for economies of scales. So typically, um, people use what is called uh, OECD equivalent scales. Um, and so in practice, it means that, for example, you assume that 
Um, a couple doesn't need double the income of uh, a single to have the same living standards. There are economies of scale, so you don't need two bathrooms or two kitchens in your, ha uh, in your house, for example. So that this equivalent case would say basically that you need only 50% more income for a couple to have the same living standards as, as, uh, as a single. And then uh, you have other adjustments for uh, the number and the age of kids and so on. Another possible measure of economic well-being is, uh, is wealth or net wealth or net worth. Uh, the difference with income is that this is not a flow, this is a stock, right? We measure the stock of available resources to a particular individual or particular household. So wealth is seen as providing uh, financial uh, security because it's something you can draw on in times of hardships or when you have an, uh, a negative income shock, for example. So wealth would include, include money saved in bank accounts, uh, as well as other, other assets, such as housing and shares and so on. It's net because we deduct uh, liabilities, such as, so basically all debts, so mortgage debts and student uh, loans and so on. Um, it's important to understand that changes in net wealth uh, are going to be driven by savings. So that means that to some extent they depend on income because savings is basically the difference between uh, income and consumption. So wealth is also a measure of um, um, previously accumulated uh, savings. Um, Wealth is also going to be affected by uh, changes in market value. So think, think about changes in housing prices, in stock market valuations. That's what we call uh, accrued capital gains. Sometimes another way to measure economic well-being is to look at consumption. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that uh, here because that's typically typically used more in the context of developing countries where we think um, statistics or information on income is not so reliable. Um, so people have tended to use uh, consumption inst instead, but the rest of my talk is going to focus on income uh, and wealth. Having said that, uh, there are these three concepts are clearly linked, right? It's clear that um, wealth is going to generate uh, returns and these returns are going to be recorded as income. Uh, and also, as we've just seen, if income is greater than consumption for a given period, then you generate a household would generate some savings and that would increase their wealth. Right? So what you typically find uh, for any given country is that wealth inequality is much higher than income inequality, which is itself uh, lower than consumption inequality. So now, how do we summarize differences among individuals? Um, so economists use um, different, many different indices, actually. Uh, but my understanding is that the public debate mostly focuses on three of them, which are to some extent um, complementary. So the first one, uh, you may have heard of it, is the Gini coefficient, that you can use it for uh, measuring in, uh, inequality in income or wealth. Uh, it's an index that is between zero, that is perfect inequality if everybody had the same uh, income or the same level of wealth, that the Gini would be zero, and it goes up to one if only one individual has all income or all wealth. It's typically though re, uh, ranging between 0.25 and so 0.25 and 0.4 uh, in rich countries. Uh, it's good to keep in mind also that it's not greatly sensitive to things that are happening at the at the bottom of the distribution, so uh, poverty, and things that are happening at the at the top of the distribution to the very rich. So perhaps that is why we also um, use top income or wealth shares. Uh, which is basically uh, answering this type of question. So what is the share of total income going to the richest 1% or to the richest 10% and so on. So this is very much, this is exclusively, exclusively focused on the top of the distribution, right? And this is something that has been, that is fairly new. I mean, it's only in the last 20 years or so that we started to look at this kind of, 
of uh, inequality uh, index. Look at poverty rates. Um, so this is based on income. Uh, this is about the share of the population with income falling uh, below a predefined uh, poverty line. So we focus here very much on the bottom of the distribution. Uh, the poverty line is a relative poverty line, meaning that is, it's defined relative to the, the income uh, going to the, re to the entire population. So it's typically either 60% or 50% of median income. So uh, now I just want to give you a, a, a very simple example and to show you that uh, the way we summarize inequality, the way we measure inequality, the way we obtain an index in the end is based on some assumptions. You have to make some assumptions. So if you take this uh, benchmark distribution A, which is assume you've got four individuals, one with income of five, the second one with income of 10, then 15 and 20. Then you can have, uh, uh, I guess we pretty, more pretty much all agree that distribution B is going to be uh, less unequal than distribution A because we've redistributed from the richest to the second ri richest individual. But then uh, you can also have a transfer uh, between the two individuals at the middle or you can have a transfer uh, between the two individuals at the bottom of the distribution. And then it's, uh, that's not so clear which distribution is the, is the least unequal, right? So different people could have different answers to that. And in a sense, it, it depends to how much weight uh, your inequality index or preferences would put on income and income changes in different parts of the, of the distribution. So these different inequality indices that we've just discussed would reflect uh, a range of uh, different views about these preferences. So for example, if you were to focus only on top income shares, you would say that distribution B is the least unequal because that's the, only, that's the one with the, the smallest uh, share of income going to the richest individual. If you were only interested in uh, poverty, you would say D is the least unequal if your poverty line is around $5 because you would say that's the, the only distribution where there is no poverty. Now, uh, once we've agreed on uh, what is economic well-being, what is the index uh, we want to use, we still have to find the data to measure, po uh, to measure inequality. And then we need uh, data that is representative of the entire population if we are interested in in inequ measuring inequality for Australia as a country. And we need a data that is good enough to capture uh, all income sources or all yeah. wealth assets that we are interested in. So there are basically two types of data we can draw on. Uh, the first one is survey data or household survey data. There are quite a few in Australia. Uh, the advantage of survey data is that it's representative, it's designed to be representative of uh, the world population. It has detailed information on income and it also allows for the construction of household and individual income series, right? Um, the disadvantage is that it, uh, it is limited in size, so that means we have imprecision in our estimates of uh, inequality. And it's not so good at capturing income at the very top because typically the very rich are either uh, too busy to answer uh, service or if they do answer the service, they tend to under-report uh, their income for some uh, reasons. So in Australia, we have a range of service. Uh, the, perhaps the most well-known is the ABS survey of income and housing. That's the longest running survey. Uh, it, it's usually the, the first um, data source for measuring uh, income inequality. Uh, the problem with it is that they've made some quite a few changes uh, since the 2000s so that we're not too sure about the comparability of the estimates uh, over time. The second type of data you can draw on is uh, administrative data, tax records data. So if you get access to administrative data, you've got very large data sets because you have uh, basically the full population of tax filers. 
and you have a pretty good uh, coverage in principle of, of top incomes, right? Uh, unlike survey data. Um, the problem with um, tax data is that you, you don't capture uh, non-tax filers, so you, have, you don't have the full population. It's only at the individual level, so you cannot measure uh, inequality at the ha for, for household income. Um, you have limited income information, right? it's only about taxable income. And it's affected by uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance, uh, changes in the tax base or in the tax law can also affect what you see, wh what you get I in the tax data and hence the comparability of your estimates over time. Okay. All right, so yeah, in practice, uh, we tend to use in Australia the ABS data for uh, uh, the Gini coefficient and poverty rates, uh, tax data for top income shares, and uh, a combination of uh, other data sets for wealth. All right, so let's look at Australia in the, uh, and compare it to other countries. So those of you who have read Piketty may be, famous, may be familiar with this kind of, of graph where we have this huge shape in the share of income going to the top 1%. Um, so with uh, a, a high point uh, at the beginning of last century, then a low point in the 70s uh, about there, and then an increase uh, more or less since then. And that's uh, a common fact for Anglo-Saxon countries. So you could include the UK here. It's not really what you observe in other continental Europe, where uh, continental European countries, where you have more of an L shape. Uh, so not so much increase. Yeah, in continental Europe. Yeah, uh, the Gini coefficient of income. So, if instead of focusing on the top of the distribution, you look at the entire distribution, you see that Australia has a relatively high level of inequality compared to other uh, rich countries. Uh, same thing goes for uh, poverty, so poverty rate is relatively high, particularly high among those 65 and other, although here you'd have to be careful because many of them are homeowners and uh, hence don't have to pay rent. Um, recent trends in Australia, uh, so that's the, the U shape we've seen in the, the share of income going to the top 1%. It's very much driven by actually uh, the share of income going to the top 0.1% of the population, so a very small group. Um, if we look at the Gini coefficient, uh, now you've got uh, different series coming from the ABS or from the HILDA survey. Uh, as I said, there are issues about the comparability of the results across time, so that it seems though that there's been an increase leading in the years leading up to the GFC and since then there is uh, either a stable trend or a declining, somewhat declining uh, trend. In terms of poverty, perhaps the picture is a bit clearer where you've got this increase leading up to the GFC uh, marked by the red bar and uh, pretty much a steady decline uh, since then. Uh, that's wealth inequality. Uh, it's harder actually to find data on wealth inequality than on income inequality. But you see also somehow this kind of U shape uh, with uh, a low point in the 60s, 70s and somewhat of an increase uh, since then. All right, so uh, I'd like to spend my last few minutes talking about the drivers of uh, inequality. So first you may ask, so why do we have inequality in the first place? And uh, a good thing to keep in mind is that most of the income, most of the income going to most households is coming from wages and salaries. So that's the first place to look for uh, inequalities. And inequalities in terms of earnings are going to be driven by things like ability, effort, and uh, preferences, but also by luck, connection, misfortune. So that's what Alison was, uh, that's, it <coughs> relates to some extent to what Alison was mentioning in, in terms of uh, how do you think about uh, inequality of opportunities versus um, equal inequality of outcomes. It could be also driven by discrimination and the unequal dis distribution of wealth could be affecting, uh, is also going to affect the distribution of income because wealth uh, generates returns. But if we think about uh, what can contribute to an increase in uh, inequality, 
Well, there is uh, now a fair bit of evidence, but still a debate about the contribution of globalization, skilled bias techni technical change, raising, ed raising educational premiums. Uh, it's also clear that demographic changes are going to affect um, inequality, so aging, uh, the, the higher proportion of sole parents immigration. Uh, other factors have been found to affect in many countries uh, inequality, that's the decline in the power of new unions, so the reduced bargaining powers of workers, but policies is a, is a, big, is a big factor as well. So think about tax, cut, tax cuts, reduced safety nets, so less generous uh, welfare payments, tax reforms that are favoring capital over uh, labor income, uh, financial liberalization against favoring capital uh, uh, over income, uh, the removal of inheritance uh, or the reduction of, of inheritance taxes and the minimum wage also is, are all going to affect inequality. Just to finish on, I'm going to skip that, on some work we did using the, um, the Melbourne Institute Tax and Transfer Simulator, looking at the period between 99 and 2008 and trying to find, uh, trying to find the, the drivers be behind this increase in inequality. And we found that, uh, that's the, the thing in red, that uh, the inequality index we were interested in, so the, the Gini coefficient for disposable income, there was a relatively large increase and half of it was driven by policy changes. So uh, changes in the tax schedule, so tax rates, tax thresholds, and changes in uh, transfer policies, so the level of uh, benefit payments. So this indicates that policy can play a big role and has played uh, a big role uh, in Australia in, in driving uh, inequality, which is consistent also what with what you find in, in other countries. And this is just a summary, so I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, further readings for those who are interested. Thank you.